All right, so we are diving into a pretty heavy topic today, uh, but again, one that I think is undoubtedly necessary for our, our conversations in this class and kind of for conversations both as they exist um, in society and in college campuses and just kind of as we think about alcohol's role and alcohol's um, presence in society. And so today we turn to um, an article called <clears throat> excuse me, Alcohol and Rape, and it is written by Nicholas Dixon. Um, and and again, I know that this can be a hard, hard, difficult subject to talk about, but hopefully as we move through Dixon's piece here, we can kind of, again, find, um, um, find notable and worthy takeaways. Okay. All right. So here we go. Many date or acquaintance rapes, especially those that occur in college, involve the use of alcohol by both the rapist and the victim. Okay. To what extent, if any, should the fact that a woman has been drinking alcohol before she has, been, before she has sexual relations affect our determination on whether or not she has been raped? Okay. So I will consider the impact of a woman's intake of alcohol on both kind of the guilty act and the guilty mind of the elements of rape. Okay, so thinking about, again, um, the level of intention here as it relates to both alcohol consumption and the perpetration of, of, of terrible and harmful behaviors. I will focus on situations when women who have been drinking provide varying levels of acquiesce, meaning agreeance to sex. Let us begin considering two relatively straightforward examples, which we can use uh, as limiting cases of sexual encounters involving alcohol. This first one is undoubtedly um, um, pretty heavy, so um, just as 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 uh, precursory. Okay, so these are just two examples. Okay, to kind of work with, as Nicholas uh, is giving us, as Dixon is giving us. In 1988, four Florida State fraternity members allegedly uh, allegedly had sex with an 18-year-old female student after she passed out with an almost lethal blood alcohol level of 0.349. Afterwards, she was allegedly dumped in a different fraternity house. If these events, which led to a five-year ban on the fraternity chapter, really happened, the woman was certainly raped, right? Since a woman who, has, who is unconscious after heavy drinking is able to consent, the fraternity members committed the, um, you know, the guilty, um, the guilty act, and also had the guilty mind, right? Had the intention here. Okay. Um, moreover, any claim that they were unaware of her lack of consent. Uh, and thus potentially negating her guilty mind uh, would ring hollow, right? It wouldn't exist, right? If somebody's passed out, you can very clearly know that they are not consenting to whatever behavior. Um, they're not consenting in any sort of capacity, right? Um, <clears throat> whether we may, we may extrapolate beyond this extreme case to situations where a person is so drunk that while she is, unconscious, while she is conscious, she is barely aware of where she is and who her partner is, and she has no recollection of what happened the following day, she may acquiesce, and she may say yes, and give physiological responses that indicate consent. And she may even say yes when whether she wants to have sex, but her mental state is so impaired by alcohol that she cannot give sufficiently meaningful level of consent. Okay. And so again, right, like this is where we get pretty heavy and like we, we, we are all peripherally familiar with situations like this. Maybe we're firsthand kind of familiar with situations like this, either friends or family members or just kind of, you know, being part of kind of a, um, you know, a, a society and a culture that drinks, right? That these situations happen and they're very serious and they're very, um, and they have to be taken seriously, right? But in these case, right, and, and, and what's being offered here is this first kind of like preliminary case, especially kind of the example from Florida State, um, undoubtedly, that, that is sexual um, assault, that is rape, right? And even in the second case where, you know, somebody's really, really drunk, really, really impaired, you know, and might say yes or might kind of behave a particular way, there has to be that judgment to recognize that maybe they're not in the capacity to give kind of full, autonomous, well-thought-out consent, okay? So that's kind of one category to think about with regards to alcohol and rape. The second one here uh, that Dixon offers is, is titled, A Regrettable Sexual Encounter. A male, and working within the heteronormative framework. And this is probably more commonplace, right? 
A male and female college student go out on a dinner date. Both drink a relatively small amount of alcohol, say a glass of wine or beer. The conversation flows freely. She, agree, she agrees to go back to his place to continue the evening. They have one more drink there, start kissing and making out, and he asks her to spend the night. She's not drunk and, impressed by the gentle and communicative manner, accepts his offer. However, she's not used to drinking, and although she's not significantly cognitively impaired, her speech is not splurred, and her conversation is lucid. Her inhibitions have been markedly lowered by the alcohol. When she wakes up alongside him the following morning, she bitter she bitterly regrets their lovemaking. No rape has occurred. While she now regrets having spent the night with her date, and would likely and would quite likely not have agreed to do so were she not uh, drunk any alcohol, her consent at the time was sufficiently voluntarily to rule out any questions of rape. While their sexual encounter violated her more lasting values, perhaps, this, is no more, uh, this no more entails that she did not really consent than the fact that my overeating at a dinner violates my long-term plan to diet. Okay? There is a distinction that exists, Dixon says, between rape and bad sex. Moreover, the kind of next move that Dixon makes is he claims and wants us to be familiar with what's called impaired sex. Right? Um, which, again, is going to be different than that first kind of pretty intense example that he offered. Okay? So that's where we're going to pick up in the next video.